Hi, I'm Wanda Urbanska. Imagine this science fiction scenario. Suppose that sometime in the near future, our children were allowed no connection with nature. None. All children were allowed to watch television. All children were permitted unlimited access to computers and other electronic devices. All children were encouraged, not only by government policy, but also by every cultural force imaginable to live in a virtual world. But access to nature? No, strictly forbidden. Nature, our government informed us, was simply too dangerous. A child might get hurt in nature or be bitten by a tick. Besides, the government decreed, nature had become irrelevant for kids. Nature had nothing to do with the actual experience of children, the vast majority of whom live in a human-constructed world, far from where nature might have any impact on a child's consciousness. Far-fetched? Well, before you dismiss this scenario altogether, a world in which children and nature never meet, I want you to meet Richard Louv. But before we okay. hear from Richard Louv, let me introduce his guiding star, one of the great wise men of our time, cultural historian Thomas Berry. Three of Thomas Berry's works, The Dream of the Earth, The Universe Story with Brian Swim, and The Great Work, have transformed the way we understand our relationship with the cosmos and have called us to our innate sense of wonder as we restore ecological balance. I think uh, wonder is almost the first thing. Just this uh, remarkable brilliance of expression of the natural world, of, this, of the seasons and the, uh, the dawn and the sunset and the, all the various phenomena of nature. To miss this is to miss the foundations of everything. It all begins in the wonder, the beauty, and the intimacy of the stars and the sun and the moon and the land and the sea and the air and this whole enormous experience that's just so stunning to a person who is uh, awake that that's why Richard Liu tells us that a child who doesn't have this experience uh, will end up with a nature deficit disorder. It will not have a context in which to relate the experiences that they have, and just simply human experience is not sufficient. Richard Louv's book, Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder has helped focus national attention on the disconnect between children and nature. My son Henry and I visited Richard at his San Diego home. We now know from uh, about a dozen years, finally, of studies that have started emerging after really ignoring this issue in terms of uh, nature's impact on child development. We now know that uh, nature is very important for a healthy child development helps with attention span, helps with um, uh, cognitive uh, functioning, helps with stress reduction, helps with self-confidence, helps with uh, creativity. There's a long list of things now we know it has this enormous effect on. And why would we want to deny that to any child? E.O. Wilson at Harvard has what he calls the biophilia hypothesis. Basically, we are all still hunters and gatherers biologically. We've not changed biologically, and there is something in us that needs to be in nature, that needs to see a natural landscape. And when we don't get that, we don't do so well. Um, this is innate. We're hardwired for this. All of human history and prehistory, human children went outside, and they developed in nature. They played or they worked in nature for many of their waking hours. Uh, and within the matter of about three decades, we're seeing the virtual uh, disappearance of that kind of activity for children. The last five years, that acceleration has been f much faster than the previous even 25 years. So what exactly were we thinking? 
How did our culture, including parents, somehow divorce children from nature? Uh, they say they don't have enough time. Uh, they say they have to get their kids into these structured activities because they're worried that their child isn't going to get into a good college and on and on. So the underbelly, though, of this issue, I think, is fear, is fear primarily of strangers, uh, of stranger danger. The irony is, was when you look at the statistics on this, the actual number of stranger abductions, classic stranger abductions, has been going down or is or has been steady for at least 20 years. There are bad people out there. There are risks. But we have to begin to think in terms of comparative risk. We have to start thinking about the true risks of raising a generation and future generations under virtual protective house arrest. Risk psychologically, risk physically. Want a real risk? We'll talk about child obesity. Uh, and a risk to people's sense of community, a sense of connection to the earth. Um, and a risk to the earth itself. With the stakes so high, some of us are going to extraordinary lengths to return our children to what was once the enchanted forest. In North Carolina, the Center for Education, Imagination, and the Natural World at Timberlake Farm brings children and nature together and carries on in ways at once spiritual and practical the panoramic vision of Thomas Berry. Um, it's a world of wonder for children. And uh, they, they have these experiences that I'm talking about. They have woodlands, they have trees, they have fields, they have uh, dawn and sunset, they have all these things that a person has who has a basic contact with the natural world. Not only Barry's vision, but also their close friendship has inspired center founder Carolyn Tobin. We have known him personally for 30 years, and he's been a mentor to our work. He has, his uh, wisdom has pervaded uh, all that we do, actually. Working with Barry, the center is forging its own path, a far cry from the traditional nature center model based on scientific inquiry and nature identification. Peggy Wayland Levitt is the center's director. The mission of the center is to envision a new relationship between the inner life of the child and the beauty, wonder, and intimacy of the natural world. Here in our work, um, it's um, respect and reverence. Um, we use uh, practices of silence uh, in the earth sanctuary. Everything is regarded as, uh, every living thing is regarded as sacred, including ourselves. Uh, I have a little piece that one of the children wrote about silence, just short, that I thought um, I'd share. Um, this is a young uh, student, sixth grader, from one of our local schools. He said, in the silence, there is the sound of all the unheard things, the cry of the wind, the growing of the tree, and the beating of the hearts of the world, beating as one, one silent beat after another. Here, children experience an unmediated delight in nature and a sense of belonging. Sandy Bisdy is the naturalist educator at the center. I love watching them squeal with delight when they put their feet in the mud. I like watching them reach for the clouds. I like the way that the children so easily love everything that's around them, and I like being a part of that experience with them. In a sense, says Carolyn Tobin, all of us, parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, can do what Sandy Bisdy does with her young visitors. Rachel Carson says that every child needs a, a guide, an adult guide. So we, first of all, have to practice noticing things ourselves. Practice noticing the crow call. Practice noticing the breeze. And, and exclaim about it. I mean, this is an amazing world we live in that we've lost touch with. A significant portion of the center's work goes to doing just that programs that help educators of all kinds hear the music of the natural world, increasing their capacity for bridging children and nature. As a mother, Carolyn learned ways to connect her boys. 
We had a practice in our home uh, with my own children growing up in which every night uh, my sons were required to say what their magical moment of the day was. And a magical moment would come by simply stopping to pay attention to what was going on, the color of the sky, the sound of the earth, and to behold that moment, to take a little picture of that moment and to remember it and to bring it back to share with the family. The elegantly simple yet groundbreaking practice of the center reminds us that we can find ways, as Richard Louv says, to leave no child indoors. Peggy Whalen Levitt summarizes what we all want for our children. The children come home to themselves. It's a homecoming. It's a sense of belonging to the universe that ignites mm -hmm. their creativity, mm -hmm. their sense of being at home in the world. You know, that the world is really a pretty neat place. For many years now, an exuberant nature spirit known in human form as Joseph Cornell has been offering educators, parents, and children a forest of inspiration and inventive games and activities adults and children can play in nature as here on the grounds of the Cultural and Heritage Museums of Rock Hill, South Carolina. Cornell's Sharing Nature with Children book series is a marvel, a portal back into the woods for you and the kids in your life. One of the principles in sharing nature with children is a sense of joy should permeate the experience and uh, the, uh, the sense of play, um, so make it enjoyable. Uh, uh, one of the principles also is uh, to experience first, then talk. I asked Joseph to share a few of his games and activities, then tried them out with my son, Henry, and some of his friends. This one's called Meet a Tree. You go out into a forest uh, where the trees are distinctive. You blindfold uh, your child, and then you lead them to a very special tree. You guide their hand to uh, different parts of the tree, um, and they explore the tree, and then you bring them back. You take the blindfold off and try to see if they can find the tree. And Did Henry become a tree? Maybe not, but I doubt he'll ever think about a tree in quite the same way. Joseph calls this one the earth maze. For lack of enough pine needles, we substituted oak leaves. What you do is bury a person with pine needles and you shake out all the bugs and everything else. Yeah, I know you can't do it everywhere, uh, but you create a maze over uh, the face and then you're like looking out up at a cathedral with all the trees. It's like you're looking up from the earth itself. And uh, it's just, just people just become very, very quiet. And, and still, and that's actually what these activities try to do. Adults love this one as much as children. It's called the camera game. So it's done with two people. You have the photographer and, uh, and, the, uh, and then the camera. And you use the camera person uh, to take pictures. And you turn the camera uh, towards the view. They have their eyes closed. And then what you do is you tap the shoulder twice to open the eyes. And then you tap the shoulder again to close it. And you take the picture for about four seconds uh, because any longer what happens is the camera starts to get subconscious thoughts and that takes away from the impact of the <laughs> picture. And so like George Washington Carver, uh, he said, most people look, but they don't see. And when you focus a person and then all of a sudden they look, uh, they just look with a real clear, fresh mind and they just see it and they take it all in. One woman, Joseph says, told him that a quote-unquote photograph she took doing this exercise is still vividly in her mind after 15 years. What we need to remember is we're all kids, really. All these ideas about children and nature apply to adults, too. Now, please don't get the idea that you have to drive 100 miles to chauffeur you or your children into the natural world. We have to think in terms of nearby nature, by the way. Uh, uh, not only going to Yosemite, but the, the clump of trees at the end of your cul-de-sac. The backyard, if it's like mine, is somewhat un unmanicured. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the ravine behind a house. To adult eyes, those might not look like very much. In fact, in terms of bio biodiversity, they're not. But to a child's eyes, that can be the whole universe. And those places are important too. They're also sacred. 
Richard Louv stresses that as adults, we have to be very intentional about bringing children into nature. On their own these days, children may never break free of their electronic corrals. And we have to reclaim hope. I think within the environmental movement, that simple living movement, uh, uh, walkable cities, all of these things are, are related. Uh, and children's experience of nature is a kind of primal issue that touches all of these. And I think we have to go beyond despair. To go beyond despair, we can begin with this poem written by Thomas Berry. I asked him if he would recite it for us. It takes a universe to make a child, both an outer form and in the spirit. It takes a universe to educate a child. It takes a universe to fulfill a child. And the first obligation of each generation to the succeeding generation is to bring these two together. So that the child is fulfilled in the universe, and the universe is fulfilled in the child, while the stars sing out in the heavens. <laughs> the singular gift to share a planet, to share a universe with Thomas Berry. I hope the light he shines will shine a light on your path and the path of your children and grandchildren back into the woods, back into the enchanted forest. So to lead a child home to nature, be attentive to the natural world and let a child know just how much you love that world. Allow a child to experience the sacredness of all life in the child's own way joyfully without obligation. Share nature with a child with games and activities that allow a child to feel nature's heartbeat and help connect a child not only to natural areas but to nature in your own backyard and neighborhood. Now let's turn to where we connect with nature not only with our hearts but with our taste buds. That place would be a vegetable garden you know, whatever the season, having a garden is also a state of mind. And at this time of year, it's a state of anticipation of good things to come. When spring comes, as come it does each year to Cheryl Long's garden in Topeka, Kansas, it arrives with the promise of vegetables. Now suppose you're the editor of that venerable magazine, Mother Earth News. What's your job description? Well, you edit and you write about how to do things. But that doesn't mean you actually do those things, correct? Wrong. If you're Cheryl Long, you know the subject firsthand. Example, gardening. I happened to visit Cheryl one spring morning after a seven inch rain the night before. So her garden was a little discombobulated. But Cheryl was able to offer some basic tips for anyone like me who'd like to get started with an organic vegetable garden. The, the main thing you want to do with any kind of food gardening is you want to have dedicated areas that you plant and you fertilize and you keep the weeds out of, and then you want to have other areas where you walk. Because right. when you walk, you can feel how hard the ground gets. Yes. Whereas this is very, very soft, I get and that's you. what you want. This is my cart. I've had this for probably close to 25 years. But as you can see, uh, you can use it not just to haul dirt and leaves and so forth, but I've used it to move really big logs. Wow. And lift, lift, lift the handle. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Now, of course, we've got, you got, we've a, got, we yeah. got this tub full of water here from the rain last <laughs> Which night. Which adds a little weight to us. But, but you know, this is, this is a walnut log. It's, it's, it's all I can do to lift one end off the ground, but once I can slide this under it, the, the, the miracles of levers and wheels and yes. the mechanical advantage you get is just amazing. Another tip is well this handy and, tool, uh, the broad fork. Uh, in the spring, I would come out and I would just, it's a little wet today, but I would just push that in and loosen the soil a little bit like that. And then I would go on down. Now, that's great because it, it loosens the soil so the roots can, of your crops can move in a little easier. And it also, in the spring, lets a little air in so it tends to dry out a little sooner. This is a pussy willow bush. Uh, it's been in two years. The pussies, when they, when they bloom, they have pollen, 
and that's terrific for beneficial insects in the, in the early spring. You want to have some pollen and nectar plants blooming early, even dandelions. And the beneficial insects come in, they find that food, they hang around, and then later, if you have an aphid outbreak or something, they say, oh, I think we'll have aphids this morning. <laughs> so the beneficial insects will feed on the bugs that might otherwise cause you problems in the garden. This is the world's safest and probably cheapest pesticide. It's plain water. old water. So I was <laughs> really I was really excited to, to discover this year that a company has come out with the bug blaster and it's just a wand with a special nozzle and when you turn it on it just puts out a nice flat spray of water. Actually you kind of need to put a raincoat on because it really goes up. But see how it lets you get under yes. those leaves and just wow. just just blast off aphids, all the little small with insects just water. with just plain old water. Wow. And I just think that is just the coolest thing. If, if I were going to give people one tip about organic gardening, it would be that the very best fertilizer that they could use is free. And it's lawn clippings. People pay to dump that at the landfill, but if you talk to the mowing companies and ask them. They'll be glad to bring it to your house instead. And you have to manage it right. It gets a little little uh, stinky if you let it pile up and don't uh -huh. move it. But if you move that around, first of all, if you put it on thick, it'll kill whatever's under it. So it's like a herbicide, mm -hmm. free, mm -hmm. free, non-toxic. <laughs> and it's about 4%, 3 to 4% nitrogen when it's fresh. And that's essentially what you're buying when you buy fertilizer, the $20 bag of fertilizer. You can have this for free. You could put a half inch of fresh gra grass clippings on your soil and mix it in. A half inch layer mixed in once a year will replace all the nitrogen that you would be taking out as you were harvesting food that My year. Goodness. Put that grass on your garden, that's all the fertilizer you need. Right. What, a, what an incredibly yes, well kept secret. And look how beautiful they are. Yeah. For that matter, how beautiful everything is in Cheryl's garden. The whole universe is here. The cosmos in a grain of sand. I see change every day as the plants grow. They grow so fast. You know, there's this like giant nuclear reactor up in the sky, millions of miles away. And yet the magic is that that radiation really is coming down and is hitting these plant leaves and this chlorophyll. And then suddenly we have protein and starch and food and flavor. Um, and so it's almost like kind of the whole world or a, a big pieces of the world are all visible and, and, and you're interacting with them when you're in the garden. So whether it's in the woods or in a vegetable garden in the backyard, let our program inspire you and your loved ones to embrace that natural connection. Remember, nothing's too small to make a difference. Until next time, I'm Wanda Urbanska. So remember, to get started with your organic garden, Design designated areas for gardening, other areas for walking. Use a cart for all-purpose hauling of materials. For loosening the soil and helping roots move in, use a broad fork before you plant. Use plants like pussy willows and a wand for spraying water to control pests organically. And apply all-purpose grass clippings and, surprise, you won't really need compost.